Good evening. I'm glad all of you came out on this uh, uh, South Louisiana winter night, this Dutch-like night. Uh, thanks to Tulane and, and to the uh, World Trade Center, but thanks to those in the audience, especially like Richard Campanella, John Klingman, especially my friend and partner Mac Ball for engaging this rather, uh, in, uh, with me, this involved and circuitous quest. You know, the Dutch national quest is about water. And I think when we embrace this, we have a chance here. But uh, as we look at our native landscape and think about the way we used to see this landscape, it's really not that anymore. This bird's foot delta is a matter of time. The way that this land looks like it's got some sort of substance and reality and elevation is probably less true today. We live in this island. We live on this island, within this protection system with a fading coast. We're trying, you know, the uh, wetland restoration program is taking root, maybe, if we can get some freedom to use the river. But we're a great experiment in South Louisiana. We depend, though, on this coast and this thing that's either thick water or almost land where we live. This is at Fourchon, which is a fantastic environment. I don't know how many of you have driven Route 1 to go to Port Fushan, but I really encourage you to go see what we have there. And it serves, as you remember this image from 2005 uh, that was done out of Princeton with uh, Anthony Fontenot, uh, of, of the infrastructure that's off this coast. And the infrastructure that's on the coast and within this area, this is Norco. Now, we are an industrial coast. This is not, as the politicians say, a vacation place. This is a working place. If you look at it from a little further away, you know, it's pretty clear that there's a lot of energy flowing through this. If you can spot the island, you can spot in the rotation the flow of the water down and out. We're living at the edge, but we're living in a place that's firing all the rest of that, or through which the energy flows. But now shifting more back inside, what are we going to do with it? Why don't we make more of it? You know, this is Amsterdam, my you know, model city. The triple X is the marker of the city. It's been there a long time uh, as that sign. But they take their waste and recycle it and run their trams with it. They're recycling everything. Why are we wasting any matter in New Orleans? We're sinking away and we throw our glass away. Why are we not thinking holistically about this, and really trying to become this other city. It's really not just about water, it's about energy, it's about all these flows that are dynamic. This is a Swedish city, you know, and how do we not see the connection between all these things? We're a wall city. But let's go backwards a minute and talk about the number 10,000, you know? I mean, I mean, you know that number, it was the Dutch levels of protection, they got 10,000 as their flood protection, you know, that's their level of protection in the land stuff. Well, they don't get it with one step. They didn't get it with these barriers at Rotterdam, that's 100, many of you have heard all this. But they get 70 more out of the levee that's built into Rotterdam. So with those two modes, they've gotten 7,000. Well, that's not according to the law so they use internal water one and a half times. They get over 10,000 with that. So they're 10,500, check, meets the law. So it's three steps. In the multi-level protection, they have flood protection. You see the level one. That's what we're, we've, been benefit, we've benefited from since the storm. We've done a bunch of that. The Corps has especially. I still think, and other people study us, that we're very good at level three. That's still a a valuable thing to concentrate on, that we have good warning systems, we have good monitoring systems. Level two is the primary area of our work, which is spatial planning and how do we affect what we can do within that. So we have our three levels of protection. You know, this is the MRGO closure structure, quite remarkable as a civil structure. And then we have this, you know, this is not 
the best example of what we have as a levy in the city of New Orleans, but it's certainly not something that is an urban asset until the water comes. And then we have this. That's our flood protection system, our drain, excuse me, our drainage system. This is the Lafitte Carter's drainage canal. It's an asset only when it rains very hard, otherwise it's a liability. That other canal was an asset at all times. So we have this question, which do we want? This was something we did after, uh, after Katrina in early 2006 in St. Bernard, this very simple comparison. It's a devaluation of our landscape. You know, many of us are fortunate to live in this gorgeous garden that uptown New Orleans is. The need to extend the garden throughout the area is pretty clear. But we need to pay attention to some of the edges. Many of you have seen this. I won't keep saying how many of these images have been shown before. We have so many, but I'm still making basic points. Why is there no water in that landscape, especially in New Orleans itself? I'm assuming those in this room can identify where New Orleans is in that map. And when we have the water, we have this. And those of you who are architecture students in this room, engage the reality of this and don't get caught decorating the ugly. <laughs> and then Amsterdam, 400 years. This is a big anniversary for Amsterdam because 400 years ago they dug the ring canals or began to dig the ring canals. Certainly, they're a good investment. This is not a ring canal. This is Wester Single where people go down and touch water. Rotterdam, which is really our closest cousin in this quest, really our, our parent almost, and, you know, they're constantly trying to add water into that. They have Rotterdam Water Plan 2.0. We, if we, when we finish our work, we'll have the first water plan in the United States as a comprehensive planning document. But when they add water, this is, again, what you would like it to be, and you see how much drainage freeboard there is there. So just to keep make it sure, and I, always, I don't always show this, but I like to make sure that we Eurocentric people don't think that these cultures are the only ones who've ever known anything, the Chinese, right? Shaoxing, and then they've been working with this a long time. But it has to do with the relationship, the quantity of land to water, that ratio. So this key point that we made a while back, because it's been said, you know, I learn when people say something that's like critical, you, David, you think that the Netherlands is it's not. The bad thing, or the challenge is, it's, we have a worse design metric. You can see that. You see the peak storm occurrence. You see the peak rainfall, especially. You see how big our levees would have to be to get a 10 times factor? It's going to be difficult. But we have these ways. We have these ecological resources that we have to re-nourish, replenish. We have this perimeter defense system that's going to need some supplementing over time. I mean, our ambition in this work is not to stay here for 50 years. You know, our ambition is to let this city stay here for centuries. We've been here 290-something. How long can we make it? It's literally, it's a, it's a life and death challenge. But what was missing in this, and this is the, below the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation's drawing, and we've critiqued this, and I hope they take it in a positive way, you know, the levee and then pump station, elevated building, and then evacuate. You can do more inside, as you see with the Wester Single in Rotterdam. And you see that's our work, the retained store drain question. To understand water in an urban landscape, really in most landscapes, but in our delta landscape, you have to understand sea level. Where is it? It's not going down, is it? in the river, and the discharge, and that's problematic, and dealt with this change, and then precipitation. The one that for, is forgotten, was forgotten, is abused as groundwater. So, problems that we've identified in the water strategy three. This is Nelson Engineer's office, and they're on our team, and Charles has been a great help. Uh, water overwhelms our systems. This is above sea level. You know this image. This is at the Lafitte Carter, when we drain it so fast, it falls down, sinks, falls apart. And third, this strange Getty image that makes this either secret or horrible, whatever it is over the wall, but curious, excluded. So goals then are create this resiliency so we have the ability to manage it for changing conditions. Remember, changing conditions mean drought also. So you definitely need a place that you can get water in this landscape and keep water in this landscape, especially if you care about the temperature. Hold it. Drain it only when necessary. This is not a drainage canal. It's the bayou. But again, use this water. 
And third, use this water to improve our quality of life. We praise ourselves, pat ourselves on the back, which is rare enough in New Orleans, to say we have a great quality of life. True, we can make it better. We've created a different landscape in Louisiana from what it was when the settlers came. We've created a polar landscape, an area below sea level. You see this projection with the 10 times exaggeration of elevation, and you see the topographic difference. Richard very carefully calculated, and I think came to about 50-50, maybe 50 point something, uh, above sea level to below sea level. But we're at that sine curve, that up-down. To work with this landscape, we have to put first things first. My friend Wendell Curo in Lafourche Parish says, first geology, then biology, then sociology. Well, the Dutch say, you know, first the foundational level, soils, water, we highlight biodiversity, I'll come back to that. And then the infrastructure, which was our original obsession after Katrina, was what are we doing about our infrastructure? There's a man named Martin Strauss, who's the city architect was for a long time in Rotterdam, and he talked about New Orleans should rebuild itself around a genesis infrastructure. But we tend to concentrate on our homes and families and community. To have those sound, we have to fix the bottom levels. We have to let the, we have to let the infrastructure work for us. To understand where this infrastructure is, we have to think about, oh, well, we, the subsidence issue. One of the, this is a drawing that's really based on some work done at Tulane, uh, made by Del Taurus. And if you look, it goes, boom, boom. most of the subsidence is occurring in New Orleans. At least a hundred times what's occurring deeply, maybe a thousand, is shallow groundwater. It's not oil and gas extraction, and it's not glacial-driven subsidence. So that would say we can do something about limiting subsidence. Okay, that's the top layer above the red. The planning we're doing pays a lot of attention to this. I think that this has years and decades of study to be done to it because every site we have has different possibilities. I was at the Corps of Engineers today talking about an architectural project, and they were saying, you know, you can't get water in the ground here because the groundwater is so high. Well, that's not true. We've monitored it several places, and generally we're seeing it six or more feet down. So there is space for water in the ground, and in fact, the clay lets it in, but I'll leave that. This is all very long. So it's not only subsidence, because the subsiding soils are the peat soils, the ones that have a lot of organic matter, and here you see the map highlighted, the things that are organic and will continue to subside. Okay, this is the subsidence potential drawing. And then this is the event, the technological invention, that allowed any of this settlement to occur out there. So we've got this great technology, very easy to maintain, operate, very powerful. You know, the Surgeon Water Board will tell you that the pumps we have in the city of New Orleans can drain the Ohio River. Well, it also has this secondary effect, and we can't ignore secondary effects, you know? I mean, to the way of making this landscape that you can read this, the red line is today's landscape, the gray line was the 100 year ago, 1895 landscape, and you see how well we've done in draining it. But the problem becomes worse the lower we go, the higher we have to pump, and the worse we go, and the lower, it's not sustainable. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we're going to look at the landscape types if we come back together and think about where we live. Because we, these are not problems or solutions that exist everywhere or solutions that can work everywhere, but they're specific to the place. And the same solution that goes in Jefferson won't necessarily be that in St. Bernard. But you see the landscape types that we have made. They were not exactly this, but we've created these polders and we've got these bowls in addition to the backslope. This is an international problem. This is a broad problem that exists all over the world. This is a drawing that Taras made that really had as much to do with Bangkok as New Orleans. But it's the problem of global warming in, in some senses, that we've cover, covered the ground and we don't get the water in the ground and we're not getting the evaporation into the sky. So we've got all this runoff now that we have to deal with. And what are we doing about it? And that's using energy to pump. So we've created this thing that it applies to New York, applies to Washington, D.C., applies everywhere, applies to New Orleans. New Orleans specifically then, because we have a drainage system with a certain capacity and we've analyzed that, we've looked at the amount of excess water that 
we can't pump because we don't want to get wet all the time. And the Dutch talk about dry feet, and we all probably can feel that right now as we think about what might happen if it rained hard out there on St. Charles. There's a lot of water in these different drainage basins. You see the quantification is Jackson Square to your waist, fundamentally, 10 times, each of those bars. So it rains a whole lot in New Orleans at short intervals. The drainage system has fixed capacity without going back into that tired number now, but it, we turn the pumps on, we drain it, we have a certain amount of storage, mostly in the drainage system itself and the pipes. Beyond that, we have flooding. Our mode is to change that way, not to pump the first time it rains because I don't have to drain everything out. I have some storage capacity. I don't, it's gonna rain lightly. I don't want it out of here. I want it here. I need the water. The water's the asset. Increase the storage, delay it, and reduce the, and reduce the flooding. So, Dutch principles. We can talk a lot about the delay word, whatever it's that. But store it, drain it only when necessary, okay? The different methodology, the one I'm trying to bring up all the time, I feel like a politician myself, I talk so much about this. We don't have to drain every drop of water that falls here. Common parlance of the Good politicians is we have to work so hard, you know we, love, we live below sea level, we have to drain every drop of water that falls here. Don't be so eager. Relax a minute. Let the landscape work, okay? So this is a demonstration of the principle there at Pontilly, uh, a drawing that Rami in our office, I think, made. And this is a cartoon of what that Pontilly basin looks like, bound in by the railroad, and bound in by the industrial canal and the ridge, you see it. But the methodology taking the empty lots is to catch it as it comes down the slope. You know, Broadmoor is not, is the recipient of the water. The Irish Channel has to work to keep the water from getting to Broadmoor so quickly. We all have a job to do here. But if we do this and create, using these properties, create these connected assets, use these best practices, put the water in there and don't let it stand for more than 48 hours, which can be designed in the landscape. You know, this is dirt stuff, you know? The people who, are, who get excited about this are the people who sell crushed rock. They love, they love this stuff. They see it as money. I see it as flooding. And what you see here is by doing those and not draining anything, you take half the flood away. So you can reduce half the flooding in, Gentil in Pontilly without pumping it. So you keep it out of the drainage system. Well, that has a great effect on the area next to it because they're not competing to get out. So you peel the water off everywhere you can. Okay, so three main points. Safety first, right? Dutch principle first. None of this that we're talking about is meant to worsen our safety ratios. We cannot be at more risk. We've already been in enough risk. We have the worst repetitive race, loss ratio in the country already. So Hurricane Isaac worked. You know, they say in New York or Washington, look, I mean, the investment that was made in New Orleans worked. It paid back. They didn't flood. Well, if we can maintain it, it works. Maybe an Isaac defense system if we don't have some more money to maintain it, but it worked. That's Lakeshore Drive out there, right? This worked as intended. Mac drew this a long time ago, and I, we were nervous about it because people are going to think, well, we need more land. We don't need more land now. But in the future, if we need more flood protection, you can build dikes in the lake. You can build islands in the lake. You can build secondary defenses. You can extend the defense. Because you need a resilient package of things that you can do employ in future. But before you go outside, you've got to come back and try to realign some of the stuff inside. So long term, our recommendation on the system side is to realign the system so that it corresponds with the natural features. So we take Jefferson's Hoey Basin idea after the storm, if you remember the advocacy that Jefferson Parish is putting there, and we say the Claiborne drainage improvements should be hooked to that, and in fact, we should be trying to take that water over to the river. It'd be a very difficult right away to negotiate it here, but we have to start negotiating some collective and common interest things in New Orleans. And then we say build on the Florida Avenue Canal and take that east. That will unburden the drainage to the north. Well, that's not exactly visionary because, you know, usually you find that somebody in the past had a similar idea because they were working with nature more than we have been. So 1896, the drainage master plan was basically taking the water to the east 
not trying to convey it all across the ridge. And you see, second, they were basically trying to put the, the water that was out there into the, into the lake. So these are just our steps. We're trying to be singular about our recommendations for system, and we've quantified this, uh, at least in a broad way. So this is what I say, building on the system there and going east to uh, Florida and then taking the other water to the river and then extending that. You know, the connection of infrastructure in a city is pretty intricate, but we have some big things in New Orleans. So the I-10 Claiborne corridor, big question, because it's a drainage corridor too. VA hospital, this is anybody who was at the Thursday night talk, you can look at the, we showed the developments that are occurring along the Lafitte Carter, those are coming back toward Claiborne. Well, Claiborne has to have more drainage in it if they don't want to flood in that neighborhood. If the French Quarter, in fact, doesn't want to flood because it's backing up under hydraulic pressure. So we want to create this storage-based system. This is an image where it's along London Avenue Canal, but the point is we want to find storage anywhere, everywhere it's available to find it. You know, we have excess property in New Orleans and we act like we don't know what to do with it. Well, we have things we need to do with it. And we can create a better, wetter, healthier, less subsidence-prone city with that. A lot of natural assets. We also, if we want to be safe, need to deal with this is a primary motivation for the whole project. And I know this is very ambitious, but it's not ambitious if we care and we can demand and we can hit some sort of bank shot and get back in the game of infrastructure funding that's now coming out of New York and Sandy because we don't want to be left with these remnant infrastructures. You see now that we've done an analysis of what the challenge of taking down those flood walls is, not the levees, but the flood walls on top. And in fact, London Avenue is the most difficult to take down because you see the existing water level and you see the step one when we take it just pump away, we still are too close with the current amount of storage. We're still too close to the levee. We would have to build that up some on London Avenue. If you look at Orleans Avenue, even the core, uh, and I don't mean to say it that way, really, because they're our friends, they're, they live here with us, but even they say, well, you know, you could take those down because if you look, there's a hole already into City Park. So there's only a certain height that's an effective. And you look at the existing water level, and it takes money to take them down, but it takes money to maintain this stuff. And it can't be maintained because if you scrape the bottom, you're gonna tear it apart. And then 17th Street, okay, you could do there too. All calculations show. And then what I like is the empirical. You know, this is not some sort of complicated mental exercise all the time. Because go look. That goes through there. They don't close that when it rains hard. That's a remnant of a flood protection system. They close those gates at a hurricane. Okay? So what height is effective on those walls? So if we model this, which we have, CDM Smith really led the modeling, Jessica Watts. You look at this and you say, well, this is, this is ambitious as we go forward. This is the current residual flood on a 10-year return period flood. Okay? And then you start to look if you put some other things uh, with it, you reduce the flooding, and then you come in with a more aggressive storage regime. You've made your improvements, and you've still got a little flooding. Which, if you're really designing a landscape, you say, well, that's not good enough. Now what do I need to do? But you see how much less flooding there is by incorporating the system improvements and storage improvements, okay? And then you see we would need more work. We would need further improvements that have to do with creating lateral canals, especially in Gentilly and so forth, all right, and building on that. So that's looking far forward, about getting more safety, less flood risk, less repetitive loss. Well, to do all that, we've got to somehow harness some economic value. I mean, we don't have the wealth in this city to afford all this. How do we create wealth by doing these projects? Government's not going to give it all to us. And if you think about it, they take back a lot of what they give anyway, because if they give you $100, they take back 40 So I would like Richard to do an analysis of how much of this, however many billion we got, actually went back, you know? Uh, but anyway, we need to create our own wealth. And how do we do it? Well, one of the things you do is not just look at water, but looking at water primarily in our work, 
but look at the opportunities that exist throughout the area, because New Orleans is replete with urban opportunities. Remember, we are fundamentally an island now. So we have this limited amount of land, which is actually a benefit because you have a planning boundary. This is the East Bank only. We have a city on the west side too. But you look at Airline Carter, the Dutch can't believe you got this because over the long term you got Airline Highway. That's such an opportunity for redevelopment. It comes right in the middle of your city. New Orleanians don't know Tulane is airline because we're not seeing these long lines. We also don't necessarily see the opportunities, I think, maybe we think they're impossible to do more with these blight situations. These are blighted properties along the London Avenue Canal. Many students after the storm said, well, you got to do something with this. You should take this land. It doesn't have to be wholesale. But if you look at this pattern, you say this is not a healthy economic situation. Not going to be a place that my investment's secure. I think I'll buy something in the Irish Channel or in Bywater. Well, we need people out here. We need to occupy this city. This is a program for the locals. So this was the drawing we made during Dutch Dialogues. It still works in the London Avenue Canal. And then if you remove those, if you build the bank at a certain height, which is about plus five, then you get a situation where people can, in places, because you see that drawing doesn't say you have to take it everywhere. You see that it does come back in and say there could be houses living there, but you're increasing storage along the side of it and letting that be a place that can flood. If you think only now, and this is, we have so many things, you guys would be here tomorrow. If, in economic terms, the, the Research Triangle Park, if you look at the benefits they've gotten from their universities, we have to ask more from our universities. We have to get more from Tulane. In this case, we have to get more from UNO and Dillard. They're at either end of this canal. It's not a visible connection right now. This is the blight out there. But if you look at, then this is the ideal, idealized version to where there's more green. You got a two mile waterfront that connect two universities and now you have something that each of them can market. Dillard is quite interested in this, of course, because they would like to do that. They would like to improve their ecological studies. We have to believe we can. And if we then could understand the opportunity and leverage the private side of all this, there's a lot of waterfront property here. It's not there visibly water now, but if you could create that much in any other city, I think people would be actively going about it. And we have all these blue-green connections. They're everywhere. We have all these opportunities to run these lines through and connect things. Lafitte Carter being the one that's in the foreground, which is primary and I think last in this talk tonight. For any of this to be sustainable, for any of these water systems to be sustainable, they, ha they, they have to deal with drought, right? You have to have some way of letting water in. Nobody likes the dry ditch. We don't want a system where the canal is empty. We don't want the Palmetto Canal that's a concrete ditch with nothing in it until it rains hard and then we don't want it over the edge. So you've got to have a source for water and we have that, the original source and reason for the city, the bayou. Because it's an inlet that we can actually take water from, get into the London Avenue Canal as we need, get into the Orleans Avenue Canal with this pumping system and get to Claiborne. So you've got this natural system you can use to create a circulatory system. And then we proposed a long time ago that we need to think of it all in terms of a, a heart, a vascular system, and work at every scale. You can't do this only at the big scale and you can't do this only at the public scale. There's a private responsibility. You know, there's your house, your block, your neighborhood, and the district as it assimilates with principles that are usable. We have to make better investments with respect to our infrastructure because we're going to go build streets again in Lakeview and we're going to build them pretty much like we built them before. If we build them like we built them before, they're going to do the same thing they did before if we manage the groundwater like that and it's going to become this all-terrain vehicle uh, experiment. But if we protect the infrastructure and put it in a reasonable place and know how to build a sub-bed for a road, we can do something better. And then if we start to look at these standards and you see just a couple of versions, a dry standard and a wet standard, just diagrammatically, with how we infiltrate at the base, because in Lakeview, the storage problem can be solved in the street. It's a fully occupied area. Every area has a different storage solution. But there's one value proposition. 
which is we need to look more carefully at how we're spending this money. And the CELA projects give us storage. They're very expensive. They don't create new investment opportunities. They don't cool the air. They're just expensive storage propositions. And we can ask more and should ask more and get a better return on our investment. So then the last of this is the, the aim, right? To have an afternoon off and go to sleep by your table or whatever. <laughs> Next to the water. You know, I, I've been at this canal a, a, a few times. and You know, the Dutch flock to the sun. They're like New Yorkers. You know, the sun's there. They're all going to be there. But what's interesting is the lack of fear they have about water. And the corresponding, we have toward it. You know, don't fall in, don't fall in. And you see kids jumping from there to the boat, and their parents are saying, okay. If we're going to live here, we're going to have to do some ability to swim. <laughs> we're also going to have to say, uh. so I found this, and I, I tell this story a lot. I found this one Saturday afternoon. That was Stein Cole, a friend of ours who's working with us from the Netherlands, and we're excited. And you see the little water running through there? You see that? You know, from the woods in North Louisiana. I was very excited. Go back to the office, and Rami ruins my day on Monday when he shows me the plans for this. this are, these are the plans for that canal. Build it with concrete. Build a wall. You can't look at it. And the residents really believe they'll be safer if they have that wall because that's the way we've conditioned ourselves to think, that the wall is safety. But, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And when the failure occurs, it's catastrophic. So that would not be our recommendation. This is a drawing that uh, St uh, Bosch Schlabers made, and we have a few of these, but uh, this is the kind of presumptuousness that won't work if you take this as actually final planning. You have to engage these communities to do these things, but you also have to show opportunities because if you come to the neighborhood with only one solution or if you come with no solution except what you want, but this is the area between the parishes between Jefferson, you know this along there, and Holly Grove. And then this is when it really has rained hard, but also this is one of the most dangerous places in the city for flooding. And this is related to pump to the river and all that. So this is a way to manage a, a flood situation. We have the space. Can we negotiate the, co the coordination between Jefferson Parish and Orleans Parish? Many people will tell you that's not possible. It will never happen. Never, ever happen that Jefferson and Orleans can cooperate. We're living on an island together. So, Hoffman Triangle, another opportunity, an urban opportunity. We depicted this a while back and have brought it back to show, you know, because we have these fallow landscapes in the city. And that's not exactly great, and we could render this better, but it's good, right? I mean, you can have a green thing that's cooler. That will be sensibly cool. They built a street Hudson in New York, and they put these these green things in, and they measure the ambient temperature, and it's six degrees lower. Six degrees lower would be nice about Jan June 1st, right? You know, so you can measurably affect your climate, and you can also manage the flood. So you're creating safety, you're creating an environmental benefit, and improving the value. This is a drawing we made back a long time, Robert De Koning and, I, and But anyway, we, this is a gentilly, diagrammatically, okay? The Dutch tell me that we are the only place on Earth that has created a polder landscape with no surface water. We're unique in that way. That's not a way you really want to be unique, you know? I mean, uh, because you can't sustain it. So if we want to create a sustainable polder landscape, which we now have, you have to get water in it. Well, long ago they had a sense of how to do the WPA Canal Boulevard, you see, and we're proposing that in these areas, you see the shallower section above, we can do a very similar thing. This is after Isaac, what happened on Canal Boulevard, didn't have to pump it. And then you find, if you can, we try to accumulate in this project our, some district plans where we can actually measure and do certain interventions to show how a district creates a different identity. So this is Fillmore, which is the area east of City Park. And then water storage at a 25-acre parcel to cut flooding. Another one of our quality of life things, because if you care about your car, you want to protect it. And you know how we balance the groundwater is affecting the streets, and this is an old drawing. Uh, but up and down, right? Dry, wet, shrink, swell. What we, we've done in this uh, 
we're doing now this little experiment at, uh, at the Canal Street Canal in Jefferson Parish, a limited length. And this is a drawing of Dana Brown's. And, and what it's basically doing is saying, take those outfall canal snoots that hang out there and actually raise the water level, which will re-infiltrate the groundwater. Jefferson Parish is interested, and they did this as an experiment to test it. You can see the one on the right. They raised the water level. I heard that people were stopping and saying, oh, it looks nice this way. Um, but you've got to have storage, OK? So it's not as simple as just raise all the water levels. But if you do raise the water levels, you can fix some things. And you, it was interesting how, how thirsty the ground was, from what I hear, and how much water was flowing backwards into the ground. And then you have this, this is the same proposition, why, you know, the, why are they so ugly? No wonder nobody likes these things in New Orleans, right? But here's the alternative and alternative that we rendered about how you could change that in Jefferson Parish. This is a tie, everything's tied together, right? It's better, maybe better economic opportunity. This is a place with a vibrant economy. Elmwood works. It's this crazy experiment about how much concrete or asphalt I can pour. Uh, <laughs> You know, and how many roads can I keep confused by, and where do I go? But we, we're looking at that too, and, and these are light drawings, maybe hard to see for you, but we're trying to look at different amounts of water. And this is a sort of dry, medium flooded situation we're showing, trying to create these water lanes and, and this system that can absorb water. This is peeling concrete in Elmwood. And then we look at certain areas, and you, you can see here the water lanes. We have this water that's in there. And then when this is, uh, work in progress and then we have this system where it floods and it floods under the parking lot and you create this other way of managing water in Elmwood. This is a business proposition, right? Because these people could actually do this and they could benefit from a different identity. So this is water management in Elmwood as an economic proposition. Okay, I think last. Um, Lafitte. You know, we the Greenway's been there. 1798 was the first canal. It's the connector between the end of the bayou and the French Quarter basically the heart of the city, and the city's working on it now. Well, Mark Davis, who probably is not here, because but anyway, Mark has said that New Orleans tends to refer only to itself. Not a good situation, but nonetheless, it's true. We do know our own history, and this is a piece of our own history, the original canal that was there, and, you know, now we've got this parking lot that's, you know, a bad legacy of our getting rid of the water there, uh, but... It, it's not necessary to exclude water. This is the image of a very similar scale place in Rotterdam where they never got rid of the water and the Germans missed it somehow. Um, but that's, again, what we would have had, but we don't because it was removed. Uh, so now we have the Lafitte Greenway with a bike trail coming into it the city's working on, master plan, and what we're trying to do in this project is look at how we can do an overlay that works with what they're planning but takes care of other problems, okay? So you see the drainage impact here in Lafitte has this 50 acre feet. This is pretty good for architects who have forgotten how to do math. And um, the adjacent catchment area, you see 70 acre feet. We can drain most of it, but the effect of it again, of offsetting the drainage in one area that you don't get into the pipes on your neighbor is huge because it's all competing for that same space to get out when the flood comes. So if you hold your water, then there's space for the, it's the highway analogy. And then if you look at the Hagen Basin, where it's, which is where Parkway Bakery is. So we know this area floods badly, has big, big problems. The city looked at it a few years ago as a drainage study and pumping all the way around. I think they said it was a $15 million fix. Well, there's another way to fix it for, we believe, less money, which is to bring it into the Lafitte Carter. We don't show you the section, but basically it's just to cut it in and create a big bioswale there. There's lots of ways to get water into this area. There are lots of, this is the area down toward the turning basin. There are lots of different forms water can take. It doesn't have to follow the straight line. It can move, right? As long as it connects, it can move. These are two different ways to get a lot of water in there. And basically, we can take care of the flooding that's going to occur along Lafitte, out of the Lafitte development and other things in the Lafitte Carter. This is a priority for land use in New Orleans. It should not be secondary, should not follow and be one of those things we never get around to and afford. We've been told that the VA Medical Center, which was planned as a major retention area, and we read the number that they had for retention and said, don't worry, they got a lot of storage on site. But you know, when they did the value engineering, we're told that, oh, that got value engineered. 
there's no storage at the VA site. So it's a secondary thing and nobody watches it and Costco's not building any storage, right? Dump into the Palmetto Canal. We can't continue this city if we don't make this the priority of everyone. And if we do make it the priority, we get a beautiful place. This is again a, an image we've shown a lot, Brazil, common to what we could do environmentally. So then we also, uh, a sketch that Kate made that, you know, if we look at the Bayou transition into the Lafitte Carter, you can do some pretty cool things in that area, and the bike trail could actually cover up that horrible looking canal, which is our only ask for the current project. Take the bike trail out of the ground and put it up on this thing, the sewage and water board is okay with it. So that's, otherwise it works. This drawing Mac made that um, really shows a, let the bayou go, let the river, let the water back in. The rock dam that's been removed at the end of the bayou is the best indicator. If you just see the water move, you get health and you get vitality and you get all this energy back. Let the energy into the city. Quit blocking it up. Give us this opportunity. You know, we have not learned to, to play with this, to learn, to work with this. I mean, elevations of the bayou and elevations of the water in the Lafitte Carter are going to be different. Well, you get a chance actually to let it move down again. This is Wester Park, and this is a another drawing that Mac made quick, uh, recently that shows how that water could then fall down into the Lafitte Carter and then create a place where I believe you would see lots more nourishment, not only in the environment, but the economy. The Water Board has accepted this. This is something that High S worked on in making. Uh, uh, what are these arrows of the Water Board? Arrows of the water board are driven by the first drainage improvements and then the drainage master plan. And then we had Betsy, and we came really interested in flood protection. Now the water board is accepting that they have a new charge, urban quality and, and sustainability. It's late, guys. It's late. We're sinking. Sea's rising. We have to move. We can't move. You can't do this individually. This does require us to work together. So who is going to work on this? We only got 800,000 of us now. If you look at those population trends, I think they're right, Richard. You need a critique of all this. It's not good. We got a flood protection system we have to maintain. We have these infrastructure things we need. We need more population. The Sewage and Water Board, I've been told, thinks they need 500,000 people by 2025 for the current ask on rates to hold. We got 350? What do we have? So we're not stable, okay? We have to become active here. We can't just be sitting around. But we can't think it's only about us. And this is maybe jarring, I hope. But, you know, the question, I mean, I get all these questions, and we've heard them mostly. What about the mosquitoes? Well, it's a good answer, right? The Dutch actually talk about an amphibian culture, becoming an amphibian culture. Well, the idea of living with water, living at the water's edge, we have to start looking at these other life forms. It's not just about us either. But if we engage these things, what a wonderful garden city we can have. So we have to think about and work with these other species, these other things, the fish, you know, in Scottsdale, Arizona, Aaron was sending us this thing about the fish that maintain the canals that eat the things they don't want. There are all these life forms that are so smart. And I haven't really showed you much about trees, which are really the hero of this place. So how do we create these places? This is the first thing we do is hold on to what we have, wherever we have it. Off the London Avenue Canal, opposite Dillard, there's a 28 or so acre parcel that the city of New Orleans owns and might want to sell to be developed. We should never develop it. This is what it looks like, okay? And if we just deepen that water a little bit and get it to circulate, you don't have to go to Jean Lafitte on Sunday to walk. You can go here, and you can get the biodiversity you need. All canals are not the same. All canals are not expensive. We need natural systems. We have a round-the-year growing cycle. But these are things that horticulture, landscape architecture can solve, okay? And if we do, then maybe in a few places we get some really beautiful moments. And we get people who want to come move, want to stay here with us, right? We don't, we got, how many visitors coming? 
How many do we recruit to live here because we have all these opportunities in New Orleans? And how are we going to let the children learn? I mean, because ultimately, it's not my generation. It may not quite be my son's generation, but we're getting closer, right? So if we don't engage it at the level of the child, and if we don't learn to work with this thing, to play with water, then we have to move. That's not what any of us like to do. So uh, together only. Thank you. Thank you.